one of the purposes of meditation is to sensitize yourself to the fact that you're not simply a passive observer of what's going on. Life is not a television show that you simply sit and watch. You're actively creating the characters, designing the plot, as well as watching it. The Buddha's teachings on sankhara, fabrication, point to this. The Buddha defines fabrication as intentional acts. There's an element of intention in your experience. Everything you sense, either in the physical world or the, the mental world, has an element of intention that makes it an experience. Without that intention, you wouldn't experience anything. And because our intentions aim at happiness, what we're living with right now is the result of our attempts at happiness, our attempts at pleasure, well-being. It's a sobering thought. You look at what you're experiencing, and some of it's happy and some of it's not. And to think that this is the result of every act that you've done to achieve happiness. When you think of it in this way, you begin to see the areas where you've fallen short. But at the same time, you can focus on the areas where you have had some success. After all, if you didn't have some success, you wouldn't be here meditating. You wouldn't be a human being. You'd be prowling around in some other level of being. So the Buddha has you focus. When you practice concentration, focus on the sense of well-being that you've already got. What you're going to do is learn how to maximize that. Because one of the reasons we are so careless in the way we approach happiness is that we get concerned about it only when there's a lot of pain. You focus on the pain. You've got to fix that. And there's a sense of desperation about trying to fix our pain, fix our sufferings. And when the things get easy, then we get lazy. All we want to do is just wallow in that sense of well-being. And of course, wallowing it is not a cause for more happiness. It just eats up what we already have. So the trick is to learn how to develop a sense of well-being and then be alert, not to be heedless, to see what further good we can get out of that well-being. John Lee gives an example. He says it's like having a coconut tree. It gives coconuts. He said, you can, if you want, eat up all the coconuts. But that's all you get. It's just a sense of fullness for a while, and then it's gone, and then it's gone. But if you take some of the coconuts and plant them, you get more trees and then more trees because you're willing to taste, take what you've got and invest it. So what you're taking is a sense of well-being, and you're going to invest it in creating more well-being. So you start by focusing on where the breath feels good. Breath feels good coming in, feels good going out. If you can't get a good sense of the breath, then start with thoughts of goodwill. Wish goodwill for yourself, goodwill for other beings. That's a comfortable thought. Because it's, it's a thought that's not fighting with the wishes of any being anywhere. Everybody wants to be happy. So you wish them happiness. And then from that sense of well-being, then you focus on the breath. There should be at least some spot in the body where the breath feels good. So look at it. And look at it in such a way that you're not going to spoil that sense of well-being. Sometimes we, when you focus on the body, you tense up around the part where you're focusing. It makes it tight, makes it uncomfortable. Part of this comes from envisioning the body as something very solid. But remember, what you're experiencing here is an energy field. The energy flowing through the body. Some of the energy may seem to feel more solid. Some parts of it may seem to feel more solid than others. But if you think about the whole thing as the flowing of an energy field, if there are areas where it seems blocked or squeezed. Think of it opening up a little bit so the energy can flow easily, flows in, flows out, without you having to pull it or push it or exert any pressure on it at all. It's going to come in, come out on its own. All you have to do is just keep tabs of it, allow it to be comfortable. Think of it that way. Instead of making it comfortable, you're going to allow it to be comfortable and then allow it to stay. Don't interfere with it. In other words, since you are going to be shaping your, the present moment, try to be sensitive in how you're doing it. Alert to what you're doing. 
because every action, as the Buddha said, aims at happiness. So be alert to that, that what you're experiencing has, has an element of your intention for happiness built into it. Be sensitive to that, and also sensitive to whether it's working or not. If it's not working, you can change. Change the way you breathe, change the way you focus, change the way you conceive of your experience of the present, your experience of the body sitting here right now. Allow for a little bit more, some more possibilities. This is what a lot of the meditation opens up, is seeing the possibilities of what can be done with the present moment. For example, a thought comes into the mind, and our tendency is and to just jump with the thought and go into the thought world and take it wherever it goes. Or in other words, get taken wherever it's going to take us. But if you're really observant, you begin to notice it's possible for a thought to rise and you don't go with it. And it doesn't pull you away from the breath. After all, the breath is still here and going in and going out. If thoughts destroyed our breathing, we would have died a long time ago. But thoughts come in, thoughts go out, and the breath is still there. And there's a part of your awareness that is in touch with that. We tend to block it out so we can get into the thought, but you allow it to stay open. So when a thought comes, it doesn't pull you the way it used to. That's a possibility you may not have noticed before. And as you meditate, you find other possibilities as well. We're experimenting with the potential for finding happiness. So always keep that experimental attitude in mind. What is experiment except for the belief that maybe not everything is already known? Maybe some of the knowledge we've passed that's been passed down from other people, or maybe some of the knowledge we've cooked up ourselves is not right. Someone someone wants to find science as the belief that the experts can be wrong. The meditation serves the same sort of function, allowing you to question the things that you thought you knew for sure they may be wrong. Check that out. You've got the breath and the mind here in the present moment as your laboratory. So you work on these things to create a more stable, more satisfying sense of pleasure right here in the present moment. Even though it's fabricated, it's still it's, it's part of the path. It's the pleasure part of the path. People complain about the Four Noble Truths, that they focus on suffering. But if you look at them carefully, the, you know, the really important truth there is the path. It's the one factor of the, of the Four Noble Truths that contains all Four Noble Truths right there in right view. And its heart, though, is right concentration. You look at the definition of right concentration, there it is. It starts out with a sense of rapture and ease, or rapture and pleasure, born of seclusion. In other words, you pull the mind away from its outside objects, outside distractions, and just stay right here. And as you create a greater sense of pleasure, a greater sense of ease here in the present moment, that's the path. It's something you develop. So we're here trying to maximize the pleasure we've got. Not simply to bliss out. Well, it's nice to be able to bliss out, but you want to do it, still be alert, still be mindful, still have a sense of heedfulness. Because what's the, what's the use of this bliss? That's the next step. What's the use of this pleasure? And you found that when you have a sense of pleasure, you can see things more clearly, if you handle the pleasure right, if your attitude towards the pleasure is right. When the mind is a sense of ease and well-being, you can look at your attachments, you can look at all the other mistakes you've been making with a lot greater sense of fairness, a lot of greater sense of objectivity, less sense of being desperate. It's like the difference between people who have to worry about where tomorrow's meal is going to come from, as opposed to people who don't have to worry about that at all. When you don't have to worry about that, you have a lot more time to think about things, to look at things, ponder them. So we're providing ourselves with a skill that gives us a sense of ease right now. And because it's a skill, we can begin to trust that we can tap into it again and again and again. And that changes the way the mind approaches its experiences, a lot less desperation. Because you have to watch out for the sense of complacency that might come in when you figure you can tap into the breath at any time. But if you can overcome that complacency, you begin to realize this is an extremely useful state of mind. 
a very skillful way of approaching happiness and a very skillful way of providing for yourself or providing a foundation for yourself so you can find greater happiness. As the Buddha said, the Noble Path is fabricated. It's the highest of all kinds of fabrications. So because we know it's fabricated, we should do it mindfully, with a sense of alertness, being alert to what we're doing and alert to the results that we're getting. And this is what makes it a skill. And we see the results not only in the immediate present, but also over time. So as we said earlier, what we're living with is the results of our attempts at happiness. And we find that the results get better and better, because we're clearer about what we're doing. All the Buddha's teachings are meant to help us in this quest, this quest for a true happiness. As you said, nirvana is the ultimate happiness. That's where it's all aimed. When you're clear on this one fact, everything else falls into place. 